Meredith Rawls is um, an astronomer at the University of Washington. Uh, she's a research scientist at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which houses the LSST, the um, Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And uh, well, welcome, and please let me know if I missed anything important here. No, that that's me. You got it. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. So the reason I contacted you was because um, I'm, I'm at a point where I really need to get some more information on this. I'm curious. I do several podcasts, so this will show up in pieces in several podcasts. Um, and uh, I just need to know more about what, how do all these new lower Earth orbit constellations affect astronomy? And I, I think, I mean, there's one web that we're talking mm -hmm. about 600-something satellites. There's... Um, Amazon Kuiper, 3,200 satellites planned, Telesat, and of course the biggest one is Starlink. And uh, mm -hmm. at this point, I think they have over 2,000 satellites yeah. and they're planning to expand this to 10,000, 12,000, something yes, like that. At least 40,000 somewhat if they can get it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it's, okay. Yeah. So the reason I ended up talking to you is because um, Starlink specifically mentioned Verisi Rubin observatory as one of their contacts in the astronomy society sure. so um there must have been some meetings some discussions in the past um mm -hmm. and you yeah, they, they were like the first folks there. to they're the first folks to really start launching right and and you said so just to kind of step back a half a step like satellites sure. aren't new right they've been launching for decades and they do lots of important things right so the, the real change here is the the large numbers going up so quick and they're all going to low earth orbit which makes them brighter because they're closer um and it also they they move around really fast which has pros and cons that we can get into later um and so starlink was the first ones that we really noticed like oh they're launching like 60 at once and there are these bright trains across the sky shortly that after was back they in launched. 2019 right yeah 2019 exactly and everyone was like these are really bright like was what <laughs> And it, it, it turned out that Starlink, the SpaceX folks, were surprised too. So, you know, the kind of astronomers and the Star, the Starlink engineers were like, oh, we didn't expect anything to be this bright. And so we kind of had a shared surprise that we worked on some of the technical stuff together. Um, Tony Tyson, who's the project scientist for Rubin Observatory, um, LSST, he uh, has been in contact with several of the different um, SpaceX teams working on different aspects of engineering the satellites. And has been a really good liaison for getting them to do some different darkening mitigations that have been somewhat effective. Um, they do a couple of different things now where they uh, they rotate the satellite so it's more edge on and doesn't doesn't have as much of a reflective surface when they're going up into their orbit still up up until well they're well, ugh, up until up to where they will be when they're in their final orbit. So so, so just just to just to uh, step in there. So so they have sure. this phase when they drop them off in uh, a lower orbit and then mm -hmm. they take I don't know weeks and months to reach their final exactly. orbit. And during that time there's that that's when you see this this this, that's this when they're pearl brightest. thing spring. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that phase can go for months, depending on kind of what they decide to do. Like, right. in principle, it could just be for a few weeks. But um, there's lots of different factors that I don't even know them all that, you know, sure. affect exactly how and when they decide to raise the orbits. Using the, the, each satellite has its own little ion propulsion drive, which is cool, but it also means that it can constantly change its position in orbit. So, like, if you're trying to figure out, like, where's the thing going to be the next time it orbits the Earth, um, that isn't something you can just... Uh, extrapolate based on like a gravity orbit alone because maybe the thing is like has a trajectory of its own the entire time because it's adjusting its orbit and, which and, is a little and, bit and to my knowledge they are all kind of talking to each other other yep. and uh, it's pretty much a self-regulating kind of system where they apparently yeah, yeah i mean that's all very proprietary but but yes at, at least within the own constellation they have a, a lot Aren't of they sharing their orbits with uh, with science? Isn't there that that's what I read somewhere that they were having like a offering a database of sorts where yeah yeah so they they have been sharing uh, two different kinds of um, or orbital solution data we basically call it so there's uh, kind of a uh, what two different kinds called sorry it's still waking over here <laughs> <laughs> um, there's the the two line elements are kind of the more coarse. Uh, like, like current location of the thing and like where it's headed 
at this moment. Snapshot, no error bar, very right. like primitive format, um, but it's a standard that's been used for a while, and it gives you like a clue of where it is at whatever time that information is sent. Not super useful if you're trying to like project where it's going to be in the future. Um, a slightly more informative uh, form of data they send us is called a full state vector or um, ephemerides, which gives you more information about the trajectory of it. And um, it currently doesn't include uncertainties or error bars, which we're hope- trying to get them to start including because that would be really useful to be able to say, because sometimes they're wrong. Like we can go back retroactively and say, okay, well, you gave us this pile of orbital solution ephemerides like, you know, a week ago. And then we observed the satellites like, you know, the next day and like half of them were nowhere near where that said they would be. And they're, oh yeah, that one had some errors, sorry. And it's like, okay, well, if we've been trying to do observations, like oh, okay. we would have been completely wrong. So that that's an ongoing challenge, but they are sharing um, the data that they have, the best data that they have um, with us. They're, they're not sharing this, the super precise, like GPS-based data of where every single one is in orbit around the earth, like to super high precision with us, but it's like the next best thing. And, and that is basically publicly accessible, which is a great precedent um, because in a lot of situations, you could easily see it being something that would only sell to certain people who, you know, pay for it. Or something like All that, right. So. so let me, let me step back to 2019. There was this sure. big, big, huge uproar. I, I mainly saw this coming from the astrophotography community. Okay. Um, but then of course I started digging into this and, um, the the whole science field. I'm a very science minded person, so sure. the science is important. I'm also on this other side where uh, I'm a photographer, and my entire career is pretty much based on the internet. So I'm very happy to be able to get online wherever I need to go go online. Yeah, yeah. Especially here in Germany, internet situation not quite uh, as you wish it to be. Anyway, um, so 2019 big uproar. Um, this was three years ago. Yeah. What are the things that have changed since? Is there still is there an ongoing dialogue, or was yeah, that... there is, there, there is. is okay. Um, yeah, it's it's a little bit so. Uh, the challenge. There's so many challenges. It's a big. One it's of the a big challenges topic. is that the, yeah, the, the ongoing dialogues are are limited, right? Because they're limited to like the four companies that you mentioned earlier, like having random one on one emails with like a small subset of astronomers, and it's not like we have some yet uh we're working towards this it's not like we have a coordinated like quarterly update where like all of the uh, constellation operators like meet with any interested astronomers or astrophotographers etc observers um and like share information in like a so forum there's, there's no, no central basis. council taking not care yet. of these kind of things not no. yet so, so we, a- d- we did recently just this month actually have now formed the international astronomical union um formed a center for uh, protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. And so this is a step kind of towards that kind of bigger coordination where it's a place we would like the satellite operators to come when they have questions or want to coordinate with astronomers and the the wider observer community. Um, But it's so it's brand new, like literally it started like two weeks ago. So we're we're still kind of working on standing it up and we don't have a ton of funding because it's, you know, it's academia. It's, you know, it's not (laughs) (sighs) governments funding it or companies paying for it at this stage. Um, it's co-hosted by the um, National Optical Infrared um, Laboratory, uh, NORLAB, uh, that's run by NSF based in Arizona, and also um, the Square Kilometer Array Observatory based in the UK. So it's international, like intentionally, um, and but those are the two co-hosts. And so there's going to be a few folks hired eventually at each of those institutions to like actually work on the center, but right now we're still mostly um, doing a lot of volunteer-based uh, meetings and coordination and applying for grants um, to, you know, be able to act, pay postdocs to like do some so, research in this field, things like that. Question: Who owns space? Mm-hmm. Who owns space? <laughs> who owns space? I mean, I mean, there's <laughs> there's, there, there's companies. Yeah, this is a very tiny, yeah. small question here. No, there, yeah. there's there's companies who. who um, I don't know. My my assumption is in the United States, it's easier to just do it and then ask for forgiveness. Whereas in other jurisdictions, it might be more of a um, of a of the other way around. You need yeah. permission to do stuff before you start doing it. And uh, I'm looking at space, and space is everywhere, and the orbits go over all the countries. And yes. so, 
is there anything that you can say about that situation, about the legal situation? Yeah, so, so this is less my area of expertise, but I've sure. learned a lot by listening to colleagues and going to some of these workshops and things. And, and this is an area that a lot of folks are working in because you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's kind of like a Wild West situation, as sometimes we characterize it as, you know, right. whoever gets there first, you know, go for it. Um, there is, we do have an outer space treaty that was signed in 1967 that has some good um, tenants for basically saying nobody owns space. Like you can't, um, yeah, I, I forget Antarctic, exactly what maybe. it has in it, but right. yeah, it's sim similar to like, look, this is supposed to be like a shared international, yes. like nobody's going to put a bunch of like nukes in orbit kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Um, which is great. Like, that's good that we have that, but it's, it, it's not nearly comprehensive enough for kind of the current situation that we find ourselves in. Um, but, but you're absolutely right that in practice, what um, companies largely in the U.S., but also around the world are really saying is, hey, there's nothing stopping me from putting like thousands or tens of thousands of satellites in orbit. And if I can just like get them up there, like ASAP, like before anybody gets their act together to regulate it, like then I'd have my stuff up there. They, they um, are creating a precedent here. And SpaceX yeah. is a very, very extremely fast moving company. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's it's really tricky because I I wish that there was more of a permission required framework, but it's so challenging because like what jurisdiction do you go to? Like you say, right? They orbit over the entire planet. So like you're gonna go to like every country's government and like apply for permission, that would take like a decade. <laughs> if, <laughs> and like if, not if even it would be work possible. At all, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like maybe you go to the UN and we've actually have had some conversations with um the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. There was a session not too long ago where they actually heard uh, people, some astronomers and space lawyers talk about this topic for the first time. Um, not entirely clear like what concrete things are coming out of that yet, because it was just a month or two ago. Um, but at least it's becoming a lot more on folks' radar, um, even at that level, which is heartening. But, you know, people being vaguely aware of something at, you know, either the U.S. government level or the U.N. level versus like an actual regulation happening is like, you know, there's still some some ground to be figured so, out. So uh, what kind of astronomy is affected the most or the least and in which way? I mean, there's there's radio astronomy, there's optical yeah. astronomy, there's yeah. near horizon. LSST is, I think, near horizon. Um, there's higher inclinations. There's different types well, of LSST day. is all over everywhere. It's the whole oh, southern true. sky. True, yeah. Yeah, but there are some twilight-based surveys that, yeah, okay. that are particularly affected. So it's it's... We are the short answer is that we are still figuring this out because it okay. has only been really a couple of years since this has been fully on astronomers' radar, so to speak, and and it's it's pretty apparent that the impacts are huge in radio astronomy for one, um, because these things have to transmit to the Earth, right? They're beaming down their yeah. information, their internet signals, their whatever um, to ground stations, and even if they're not using bands that are protected for radio astronomy, like there's side lobes, there's like, you know, radio astronomers, like don't just observe in the protected bands because you know, astrophysics happens across the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so the former plan they had to move to geographically isolated areas to like avoid most radio noise, like doesn't work in a paradigm when there's a bunch of loud stuff orbiting all the time. So they're really freaked out about that. <laughs> um, and I'm not a radio astronomer, so I, I am less equipped to speak to the specifics, but that's the gist of it. Um, and in optical astronomy, are, as far as we can tell, some of the biggest impacts are for these wide field, um, large telescope surveys like Rubin Observatory's LSST, right? Which is really how I got involved in this whole thing. And the issue there is that you're taking pictures of huge swaths of the sky every time you take a picture. And you you're really sensitive to faint things. And those are the two characteristics that actually make the Rubin Observatory such an awesome vehicle for discovery. Like, right, we're going to find new faint stuff or like moving things like asteroids that we wouldn't have expected, right? But that's the exact same set of characteristics that make it highly vulnerable to bright low earth orbit satellites just whizzing across the frame and potentially blocking something we're trying to observe or being so bright that you get these weird overtones and it's not just one streak but like multiple streaks um if it's bright enough and um and other you know remains to be seen exactly what that'll look like because Rubin Observatory doesn't turn on for a couple of years and there's going to be even more things then so 
Do we yeah. do we uh, distinguish there between the phase when they move to their orbit and when they are in orbit? Or I mean, they, sure. they are they are pretty yeah. much launching once a week now yeah. for this year. So yeah. so I think there will be permanent bo moving satellites up to their you orbit. You are absolutely right? right. That's a point I often make that people don't think about because you're like, okay, well if they're at their operational orbit and they're like below some brightness threshold, like doesn't that solve the problem? It's like well no because as you say they're constantly yeah. replenishing the population because the satellite will go on like, for years yeah the nominal lifespan for a set of sat for a single satellite is something of order five years so if you're trying to maintain a population of like even just ten thousand, which is fewer than they want but more than they have right now um you're just constantly sending them up and bringing them down and when you bring them down they they burn up which is good because you don't have space chunks lingering around but it potentially adds like a bunch of aluminum to the atmosphere which could have like environmental consequences which is a whole fun side discussion <laughs> yeah so that's great I was not aware and they're of that. bright it's like a freaking meteor like every time right <laughs> uh, of course and some of that stays yeah. in the atmosphere of course yeah exactly yeah wow. and, it's, and it's like orders of magnitude more than just like the normal amount of meteor stuff that we get because of the sheer number they're doing. Yeah. So, and, and launching them is also super bright. And, you know, how long it takes to get up to that orbital um, altitude, right. you know, is kind of a function of how they decide to do it. So has astronomy adapted in the last two, three years? Uh, we've certainly come up with some recommendations um, as to whether or not those recommendations are being fully funded or carried out, that's a work in progress. Um, right. I would point you to, there's, a, there's been a few reports that have come out that have kind of distilled this that I definitely refer you to. And maybe I already sent these to you in an email. Um, so there were two SATCON, Satellite Constellation, workshops. Um, there was one in 2020 and one in 2021, both virtual, obviously. And that was more, it was more US focused because it was sponsored by the, the NSF, National Science Foundation, and um, the American Astronomical Society. But we had folks from, other countries and we tried to expand it a little bit beyond just like professional u.s astronomers so there was some astrophotographers represented and we had folks from satellite operators in the conversation and so both of those um, workshops produced reports the first set was kind of like what should we even be doing like let's even wrap our minds around the problem and the second one was like okay now that like we've written down the recommendations like what's the path to implementing them um, so that's kind of what those two things were. And, and now we're trying to actually do that with this new center for one. And then the more international set of workshops that took place were called Dark and Quiet Skies. Um, also, there was one in 2020 and one in 2021, also virtual. Um, and they tried to make the second one in person and then a volcano went off in La Palma and it was <laughs> completely, it was like, okay, great. <laughs> I guess it's all Zoom anyway. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to go anyway because it's too far and there is still a pandemic, but anyway. <laughs> Yes, there is. Um, yeah, so they um, they and, and that was so that was more international, and it wasn't just satellites. It was like all things light pollution, radio interference, um, but also a, a separate working group for the satellite constellation issue specifically. And those were the reports, and they, they, yeah, they wrote a set of reports for each of those workshops as well. And that was what was um, leading to presenting to the UN's COPUS, um, kind of the results from from those reports and like what we should do as an international community of astronomers and observers to try to actually make progress on this. And, and we didn't just look at it from a scientific perspective. There's a whole um, policy um, regulatory kind of set of recommendations as well in there that I definitely recommend you take a look at because folks who were way more versed in that than me, like wrote things down. But it's interesting because we, we tried to get a like a diverse set of folks from the different perspectives, like into the policy subgroups, so both SATCON and for dark and quiet skies. And they didn't always agree because it turns out there's a lot of different ways to approach this and people have conflicting interests and it's hard. Um, so the report is interesting because you can see like, sometimes they'll be like, this is one approach and they're about, well, or like, this is another approach or like, oh, or, you know, there's trade offs. So here's another approach. And so it's very like, there, it's not always one coherent, like thing we should do period. It's like, it's laying out some options. Which so is interesting. in addition to the, the ast astronomical community implementing mm -hmm. or trying to implement uh, ways to mitigate the problems, um, there's of course the, the whole 
it's the other the other industry side of things yes, who yeah. Yeah. are i mean as a result of the 2019 discussions i remember reading that uh, starling tried a few things to mitigate the brightness the reflections they came up with i don't know they painted one black and that didn't work yep. and then they came up with the visors that yep. uh, shield the sun from some of the more reflective parts of the satellite and then the the whole attitude uh, mm -hmm. Uh, adjustment to make it uh, less reflective in the twilight. Yep. So, um, do these updates make any substantial difference? So they help. So in in the case of the first one, uh, the the dark sat experiment, um, it, it did make it darker. It didn't make it quite as dark as we would have liked, but it also made it too hot for it to like that, work properly. Yeah, that overheated. So that was what I what I read. Minor yeah. problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, with with the the attitude adjustment, that's when they're going up into their um. Uh, when they're not yet at their final orbital altitude, and that does help, but during, it's still the during the climbing phase. phase that's yeah, during the climbing phase. Okay. Do, don't yeah. they do this in orbit? Like I, in the final orbit? Maybe. Okay, but I, really I think it, it was primarily in the the orbit raise phase. I think. Yeah. All right. Um, and the, and then yeah, the, the visors was the next thing they tried, and the visors actually worked pretty well too, but they didn't always deploy. And so sometimes the visor was just like not working properly because they were stuck or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, get, I don't know any of the details. I have not signed an NDA, so I don't get to go to the like insider right. club meetings, <laughs> which I'm fine with. Um, uh, but I think that they, they then stopped using visors is my understanding because they switched from using, so satellites have to be able to talk to each other, right? Like you were saying, they have to be able to communicate between Starlink to Starlink satellite. And they were using radio for that, but they switched to using like an, a near infrared laser, apparently, which That's what in I read, principle yes. reduces the amount of radio frequency bouncing around, which could be good. Um, but apparently, if they were going to switch to lasers, they couldn't have a visor because the visor would block the laser. Oh, and the laser added a bunch of weight, and they couldn't have that and the visor both or something, right? It's complicated. Like I get it. So the, they they were like next the visors, and I think last I heard is they're working on some different um, experimental black paint that won't like overheat it in some way but um i don't know but Th even even if they find the it. silver bullet so, even if they yeah. find the silver bullet then that will still take i don't know five years until they are all replaced sort of sure that, that's a very good point yeah but not it's not like they're taking yeah. down the old ones to put them up with the new tech yeah they, yeah it's still it's a great take them down process. repaint them and send them back yeah, up again. i don't How think so <laughs> yeah no just they launch the, all of the future ones then have whatever innovation they come up with and then that's true for the darkening mitigation as well as whatever other standards or hardware they change, right? They're constantly innovating, which is cool on the one hand, um, but also like... I mean, you know, it's, ugh, it's again, tricky. again, be enabling communication, education, equal <laughs> opportunity, trade and whatever for people oh, yeah. who were not online. That, that's that's very cool. And of course, mm -hmm. I think the, the latest uh, Ukraine situation is also taking mm -hmm. uh, some sail out of... Uh, wind out of the sails because now they have like i don't know a few thousand terminals there yeah um, no, and there's so, there are real needs for satellite internet like so uh, like. so i'm I'm really <laughs> torn between two i'm sitting between chairs here you. yeah so yeah. what what are the kind of observation how does this whole thing reflect in oh pun not intended in the in the observations <laughs> um what do you see when you look at oh sure observations so now yeah, so if you take, you know, it, it's if you try to take an image of like your favorite star or galaxy or something, and there happens to be some satellites, you just get these really bright streaks across your image. Um, and at the moment, there's not, a, we don't yet have a tool that can tell you, like, that can predict that in an accurate enough way to be like, okay, if you just waited 10 minutes and took your observation later, like, you could avoid it. And, and Actually, I'm currently working on writing a proposal to build a tool like that. That would be really helpful. But, like, like there are these yeah. websites where you can find out when and where you'll see satellite flares from Iridium yep, and so on. Exactly. That's yeah. similar kind of an idea. The, the trick, yeah. though, really is that these are, because they have the ion propulsion drives for the Starlinks and, and the other operators, I believe, also they have like around. the ability to adjust their stuff kind of whenever they want. And so we really need high-precision orbital solution data um, fed into it. And, and it's tricky because they're in low Earth orbit, so Earth's atmosphere doesn't just magically disappear at some altitude, right? And so when there's solar activity, um, that affects like the density of Earth's atmosphere, and the satellites are traveling through that, and so they have to make additional like operational or, or thrust adjustments to stay roughly where they need to be. And so they're, you know, they're constantly 
dealing with like a real space environment. Um, and you can't just predict where it's going to be eight, 12, 24 hours later, um, accurately based on like one data point, you need to have like very, very frequent updates, um, to be able to get down to the precision of, will it be in my little field of view tomorrow? Um, it was so that that's a real technical challenge. And different um, observatories have very different fields of views. The LSST yes. is pretty wide angle. It's a, yeah, as but you still like to know, like, is it going to go right through the middle, or is it going to like be barely on the edge? So I don't care. Yeah, right, true. that is still like would be really useful. Or spectroscopy is a whole another thing. So uh, with spectroscopy, right, you don't take an image, but use a little slit or a fiber to spread out the the light and see all the different wavelengths. And if you're taking your, often you have to take a really long exposure to get like enough photons for the spectrum to look decent. And so you'll like sit on a galaxy or a star or whatever for like an hour or two. If a satellite happens to cross during that observation, you might not even know it. And then you're just reducing your data later and you're like, oh, there's my spectrum has a little bit of solar spectrum in it. And you might not even know that that wasn't real. And astronomy uh, d these days isn't, isn't necessarily someone sitting in an observatory no. looking through a, a lens. Not at all. The, not at uh -huh. all. It's, um, it's very automated. And yeah. so unless you happen, so what one of our actual recommendations from, I think it was the Dark and Quiet Skies 1 report, was to have all um, high resolution spectrometer instruments equipped with a secondary small telescope that images simultaneously so that you can retroactively figure that out, which is like completely intractable for like, any random observatory to be like, just build a bonus telescope in your spare time with your extra money um, to mitigate this problem. And then, and then in the best case, you're mitigating it by saying, throw that one out. Right. You're not like forecasting in a meaningful way. Unless, so, unless you have very precise yeah. data on when yeah. that will happen, because yeah. I, even, even, even if you knew that it doesn't necessarily mean that, yeah. okay, you'll just add another hour to your observations. Cause that, those telescope times probably need yeah. to be reserved. Well, and you could start it out. a little later. You could look at a different target, you know, before and then start your long integration on this galaxy like 20 minutes later to avoid the really bright satellite. You know, in principle, that kind of a thing, like there are already optimizers and schedulers algorithms for a lot of these bigger telescopes that make trade-offs based on like how high is your target in the sky? Where's the moon? Um, you know, something about the weather, the humidity maybe. Um, so, so that's not completely like unrealistic but yeah so, so one of the challenges though really is being able to get a, an accurate enough idea of where things are and, and it's interesting there's a couple of different startups that are trying to solve this problem in a very probably will sell you things that are expensive kind of way um one of them is leo labs this is a company that um they have a bunch of active radar stations around uh, the world now and they have been building up their own a database of where lots of debris and active satellites in low Earth orbit are with like super high precision updates. Um, and they actually have signed contracts with all of the big satellite constellation oh. operators to sell them high precision data of where their own stuff is so that they can avoid collisions or, or de debris near their stuff and their own stuff. Um, so but you not need a other bigger budget. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's completely unaffordable on any kind of academic um, pay scale because the, the data product that they're creating is, you know, or the, the product they're selling is the data of where the stuff is. So we, we've had some conversations with them and, and, and there might be some opportunities to get a little bit of that information available to observers without paying an arm and a leg. But um, it's, it's somewhat incompatible business model with like, you know, what we try to do in, in academia with our, our meager budgets. So the, the, the other one that's interesting that I'm keeping an eye on, um, that my colleague, Mori Baja, he's based at um, University of Texas, Austin. He's more of an aerospace background. Um, and he is now part of this startup called Privateer. And they are, it's like funded by um, Steve Wozniak. Um, oh I yeah, guess I heard they're of like this, yeah. Now. Yeah, and, and so they're, and I was, I was skeptical at first because their plan is to launch a satellite constellation to keep track of where all the things are. And I was like, hmm. really another one? Why? Uh, but, you know, this could work if they have tiny satellites that are active radar -ing to figure out where everything else is and maybe making that slightly more available than like Leo Labs is making their data. Um, I could see that being really valuable for observers um, to have a, a more high precision idea of, you know, where things might be in their image, you know, 
tonight or tomorrow night and to help avoid collisions. So, but they're very new and they don't have anything up yet. Um, so that would be something else to keep an eye on. But it's it's a very fast moving space. And so it's it's really fascinating to see how the satellite operators and other like uh, startup type people are moving like lightning speed. And there's us here over in academia land being like, oh, maybe you want to like, write a grant to like get a postdoc in a year to like work on this. And then there's like the policy regulation, right? So it's like three mismatched timescales. Um, and it's, yeah. It's so are there any benefits to astronomy from these constellations? Oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I, hadn't, I don't think I've been asked that before. <laughs> <laughs> other than other than I don't know having having observat observatory at the end of the world and getting better internet there. Yeah, I mean certainly so some of the constellations' goal is to provide better internet access, and you know that's certainly a real need for remote sites, which could include observatories. Yeah, that's fair. Um, But of course, Starling is not the only one. There's there's a lot of observation yeah. stuff going up there right now, and uh, sure. uh, commercial observation satellites and these kind of things for different uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Starling obviously being the biggest of them yeah. all. Hmm. Um, no, so I, nothing comes to mind immediately as a, as a direct <laughs> benefit to astronomy. I mean, obviously, you know, I love space telescopes, right? Um, but you know, we we kind of build one every thirty years. Not should, like, you know, 30 every month. We should just shoot up more, more James Webb telescopes. <laughs> My God, if we had the budget, we so would. <laughs> what, a, what an amazing project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, th that was so heartening, you know, knock on every wood nearby, but it oh. seems to be working brilliantly so far, I and followed, I'm so excited I followed to get this, data from I it. I followed every minute of the progress. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah. I'm not directly involved with the team, but I know folks who are, and it's just amazing. Yeah. It is, yeah. We should have more space telescopes. That would take care. Well, they're just, just so expensive. <laughs> just put them slightly, slightly above lower Earth Earth orbit, and then yeah, because Hubble actually Hubble's still up there. It's still doing stuff. It's in low Earth orbit, right with all the other satellites, and it's been getting full. How bombed. big is the danger of of uh, the collisions and the whole thing coming down in one fell swoop because of debris <sighs> and stuff? They, I, my, my understanding is that if if something happens, something crashes into another the one then uh the, there's still enough drag for to, to bring them down within i don't know a year or something so that that is one benefit of low earth orbit is that if something fails or crashes into something else like eventually they all deorbit and burn up and there's not a bunch of junk left over like and that's something they tout is like we're being sustainable like we're using low earth orbit like you know any problems like you know burn up crashy whatever no problem which is true um But the risk, like, once things get super crowded, like, you're gonna have unintentional collisions. And and where I, I honestly think we're lucky that we haven't had more. Like, there's been one big collision, like, in, like, 2000-something, um, before it was getting this crowded. And it was just, like, a random thing. But it made a whole bunch of debris. Well, like, there, there's there was, there was of, one by a Russian satellite, I think, that... Uh, well, and then there was an intentional... That we like, don't really know about, because yeah. it's a military thing or something along those yeah. lines. Yeah, that was like an anti-satellite test situation, which was not great at all, because anytime you try to, like, blow up a satellite with a satellite, it's, you're just going to get debris galore, and that's just not good for anyone else in that same area. Yeah, and, and so there's there's a real fear of this thing called Kessler syndrome, uh, which you probably heard of, and it's the basic idea is that once you start getting some amount of debris in a certain orbital shell or orbital height, then eventually it cascades and it you make more collisions just to just be more reaction, likely to happen. Yeah. And then suddenly you just get this chain reaction. Exactly. And, it, and it's just like everything is debris and you can't actually use low earth orbit anymore. And so at least the, the, the companies that are launching a bunch of stuff into low earth orbit are aware of this and they don't want it to happen either because they will completely lose their business model if everything is debris. So we have a shared incentive there, at least, to a point. So do, do they have, But, like, a committee of sorts, an organization where they... Or is, 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 is this all behind closed doors? Um, well, so so they a lot of their stuff is proprietary, but they do have, um, like, I think it's called the Satellite Industry Association um, that have, you know, does so. I don't know if they do lobbying or if they do... I don't know what they do. <laughs> I mean, I, I've, I, I doubt that SpaceX and Amazon are talking to each other in much detail there. They're Not in much fierce detail, competition. No. No. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's very much a competitive who can get the most things up first and sell the most terminal access, whatever kind of thing. So yeah. what are the next steps from from the academia side? Well, we're, we're really hopeful that this new IAU center will be a place that can attract some more funding resources and, and really be a kind of a, a central nexus or hub for coordinating a lot of this work. Because as the more folks that we've talked to, like in the greater astronomical community, which includes amateurs and astrophotographers, um, like the more that people are developing their own ad hoc little workarounds or their own small side studies to like uh, characterize a bit of the problem for their specific situation or writing a paper about like, oh, we saw this many satellites in this six month period in our survey. Um, and I feel like if we can kind of corral that work and have it all be in one place where everyone who's concerned about similar things is more aware of it, that that will go a long ways towards, you know, like, you know, forging collaborations and, and getting folks to work together um, instead of, you know, reinventing things accidentally because they're not aware of what everybody else is doing. Because it's, it's a new subfield almost, like in astronomy, if you will. That like you dealing didn't, with that. That you possibly. didn't ask for, right? No, we didn't. <laughs> so so has have these constellations, especially Starlink, have 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 they had any any direct impact on your work that you do? Have well, the, you seen the, the impact? The biggest impact on my work is that I spend most of my time on this these days. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So, so well, th that's a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but I spend a lot of my time on it these days. Yeah. So mostly, I write data pipelines for um, processing images that Rubin Observatory is going to take because it's it's a really amazing observatory, and we're we're gonna discover all kinds of cool stuff in the sky, even if we have to deal with a whole bunch of satellites, like it's not going to ruin everything. It's just going to make it harder in some ways. Um, and uh, there's, there's going to be like terabytes of data every single night coming off the telescope. And so the data pipelines that we're writing has to handle that fire hose kind of in real time and turn it into useful databases. The scientists can query and, you know, do science from and not accidentally have everything that they get be, you know, satellite contamination. Um, and so bits of that have found its way into my work, which normally would just be dealing with you know, normal things like, you know. So instead um, of instead of just <laughs> instead of just just transferring and, and um, reformatting this data, you yeah. now also have a function of filtering it in some way. Yeah. But to be like, it's interesting, though, because you never go straight from a picture to data. Right. There's always not. like 17 intermediate steps. And you know, this is like an astrophotographer. Right? You have to reduce it. You have to like deal with either something cloudy or fuzzy bits or weird things or right. And and in some ways, it's even more picky when you're trying to do science out of it. Because you can't just, you know, Photoshop your funny bit out. Right. You got to be really careful about each step. Science has a uh, so. <laughs> science and art are quite different in that respect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it, there are a lot of similarities. Right. And that you have to understand each step you've done. Um, so you can kind of like, you know, undo or back it out or like be like, oh, wait, we made a mistake. You know, so there, there's some there's some overlaps. And so we're used to doing like a whole bunch of intervening steps from raw science, from raw image to scientifically useful database. Um, but this is like a whole nother step that we hadn't really anticipated having to deal with. Um, and it really remains to be seen exactly which science cases it impacts the most. I, I do think that, as you alluded to earlier, the... Um, kind of twilight based or low to the horizon things will be most affected. And that's because early in the night and also late at the night, closer to sunrise, um, more of the satellites are illuminated by the sun because they're not in earth's shadow when it's the sun's close to rising or just set. And, and that is the only time when you can do certain science. Um, like for example, searching for near earth asteroids is something you can only do like in those kind of twilight hours. And so I could absolutely see a realistic scenario where we don't see a near-Earth asteroid that could be a possible, um, you know, intersecting with Earth's, Earth's orbit, possible collision thing, until way later than we would have because there were satellites all over the images. So we weren't able to map the orbit nearly as early. I had, I had a colleague make a joke about the um, Don't Look Up movie that was on Netflix this, uh, this last Christmas time that a lot of people saw. Um, and he was like, yeah, it was very realistic, except for the part where they were looking at the images at the beginning, because the images didn't have any satellite streaks in them, and they were easily able to find the asteroid. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, you're not wrong. <laughs> That's very true, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that you think is important? 
we have touched on a lot of things. I guess the, the one piece that I would also um, throw out there is that I, I'm trying to constantly remind myself that there's more stakeholders than just like astronomers um, in this game. Right. So, so we're kind of sitting on a sea change of like fundamentally transforming the night sky for like everyone on the planet because these are right at the cusp of being it's certainly when they're brightest right it, it's just like changing the night sky and this this has you know you can start imagining the repercussions like for you know cultural practices indigenous groups um just being able to take your kid out and be like look at the milky way like ever <laughs> but they're like oh look at all I, the zoomy things and you're like no don't look at those <laughs> i remember a time when i was really excited looking up in the sky and seeing mm -hmm. a satellite because yeah. I would spot it's one. Moves. It's like there it goes. I would yeah. I would spot one. I don't know, really, really rarely, and uh, sure. and that was a cool occurrence of sorts. Yeah. Um, or I, a few times I went out and uh, and had a look at the ISS zooming over mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. sky, and that's kind of cool. It's, yeah. But um, so so you're saying this is not just going to influence uh, astronomy and astrophotography. It's also going to change. The way we see the sky because we'll see more of these things yeah. zooming yeah. around i think so a colleague of mine samantha lawler um i don't want to get her quote wrong so double check this but some something like one in every five stars um will actually be a satellite in in the future that we're heading towards with like 50 to 100,000 bright low earth orbit satellites constantly orbiting the earth so it's this almost is, gonna... is this the worst case a hundred thousand oh well so how many are no, there? Up, no. How many are up there right now in low Earth orbit? <laughs> um, in total, oh gosh, I should have these numbers in the top of my brain, but they keep changing. What I what um, I understand is that he, that that Starlink alone is going to far exceed the number of satellites that are in that yeah, have been in low Earth orbit right. before they start. Yeah, there's something like I'm gonna say five thousand right now that, total that's things around the number I heard. Yes. Yeah, of order. Again, no no direct citation there. Um. But but so there have been like for example I believe there was um, uh, a company or an organization based in Rwanda that filed with the ITU the International Telecommunications Union which is you know the international I'm going to launch stuff filing body um, and they they filed for like a constellation of three hundred and twenty thousand satellites Who now are that? they actually going to build them and launch them uh, Who but did like that? Um, some folks in Rwanda oh really yeah just like six months ago or something. And it was like, okay, that, if that's you look a lot at compared, filing, compared to what, what Starlink has filed for. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I don't know if I believe it, that any one company is going to randomly actually put over 300,000 things into orbit in the next decade, but they filed with the intent to, and there have been other, you know, so, so if you look at the filings for the ITU um, internationally and the FCC in the U S um, like there's hundreds of thousands. Um, and it really just remains to be seen how many folks can, you know, tech, overcome the technical and financial hurdles to do that before we have meaningful regulations in place. All right. It's kind of so, a race, unfortunately, at this point. So I will put all the links and the things that we talked about in the description of this video. And uh, Sure, yeah, and I can send you probably some more random links too. I actually have a paper coming out next week go ahead, um, yeah. about space environmentalism that I can send you to, but it's not, not available yet. All right, I'm looking forward to that. Meredith? <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, this was quite literally enlightening. Um, yeah, sorry this, that it's so... Uh, <laughs> sorry it's not no, better, but this happy is, to fill you this in. This is very cool information, and it really helped me get a better <laughs> picture of everything there. I'm glad. Wow. Yeah, it's it's a, it's evolving, and it's a, this is why I spend so much time on it, because it matters. <laughs> it's evolving fast. Yeah. All yeah. right, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Bye for now.